send it to the Pope. Um, I have a different job for the Pope. So she goes there and says she wants to be a nun, so the mother of Superior, I'm not a Christian, so I don't, might be getting uh, names wrong, but she says, you have to first go to the basement and copy the Gospels by hand. So she goes down and there's thousands of apprentices sitting and copying something. She goes to her desk and looks and she's being given a copy. She's told to copy from a copy. She goes and says, why am I copying from a copy? Uh, she, the mother superior says, ah, oh, you're one of those troublemakers. But you can go to the library and find the original if you want. So she goes off, starts copying. After three days, she keeps running, you know, comes running out screaming, saying, Somebody has made a mistake. It's supposed to be celebrate, not celebrate. <laughs> so if you drop one letter, it can make a huge difference. So one thing that's supposed to have happened is that all the primates have a spine in the penis, whereas humans are the only primate with a spineless penis. So one of the controller genes was lost along the way, and we lost the spine. So, sorry, ladies. Um, so what is intelligence then? So humans evolved along the way, they learned to build tools, the brain got sharper, the brain got bigger, uh, diets changed, shortened the gut actually when you went to high protein diet, the gut got shorter, that released more energy for the brain to grow, and so on and so on. So what is intelligence in this context? How much do you think? It's pretty fast. Maurice said he had one and one hour talks, I should leave <laughs> him. <laughs> Intelligence is not very well defined, but uh, there are lots of indications of intelligence. Like the bumblebee actually solves what is called a traveling salesman problem as it goes from flower to flower, which means it visits one flower only once. It doesn't go back to the same flower. So genetically it has evolved this intelligence, and it's a vertical evolution. It, does, it cannot teach uh, another bumblebee how to do that. They have just developed this over time. And there are lots of examples like siskins to the bird. They observed that the, the females were picking the male bird with the long yellow feather and they didn't know why. And they hit some seeds with uh, toothpicks and they found that the birds with the long uh, yellow feather actually much more intelligent than they, they were able to get this seed out. So the females had evolved to pick smarter males by looking at the feathers. Uh, but on the other hand, peacocks, male peacocks carry this ornate that has no utilitarian value, and females pick a male that has at least average number of eyes. They don't care if it's above average, but if it's below average, they don't like it. So there is some vanity involved in there. Is that intelligence? Maybe. Uh, cats have evolved to basically flip the drink as they drink by curling their tongues in such a way that they don't get their whiskers wet at all, compared to dogs which are just sloppy. Right? So cats have evolved this intelligence, but what is it for? It's just vanity, right? But as he was saying, intelligence is not necessary to control even the environment. With dark daisies and white daisies, with the temperature dependence growth rate, they can control their environment. So intelligence in that sense is not very precisely defined. It can be an evolutionary trait. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, things like dolphins, uh, last few years they have seen that dolphins are trying to learn uh, to walk on water, like a dance. And it's not being done for anything other than fun. But they have seen that dolphins are teaching each other how to do this. So this is considered an advanced level of intelligence where you learn something. You know, you can teach a dog a trick, but a dog cannot teach another dog the same trick. Whereas dolphins are able to learn something on their own and teach it to another dolphin. It's a bit advanced. And so getting slowly to the brain, cats have a smaller brain for their body mass. They're independent, they're socially isolated, they like to be alone. Whereas dogs, which are very friendly, have a relatively bigger brain by body mass. Okay? And they are also emotional, they have lots of emotional response and so on. So all these animals, especially mammals, have something called the amygdala. Okay, which comes from the word for am. Amygdala is essentially what defines the elephant. Remember I said the rider and the elephant? Amygdala is what converts your emotional experience into a, uh, a, 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 or a physical experience into an, an experience into an emotional response. This is what is involved in fear. So 
it's related to basically everything you can think of. How the mind uh, perceives risk, how it responds to risk. If you have a bigger than normal amygdala, you tend to be very social. When you see Boris going to a bar and being friendly to all the girls, you know that he has a bigger amygdala. Okay? But on the other hand, a bigger amygdala doesn't mean they are happy. So maybe he goes home and cries. But nonetheless, amygdala makes your social network generally bigger. And they found with experiments with monkeys that actually if you artificially increase their social network, the amygdala response and gets bigger. So they have also found that Buddhists have developed this technique where they use meditation to make their amygdala bigger. This increases your empathy and sympathy and makes you more compassionate. So this is essentially, it's related to how artistic you are, whether you are gay or not, whether you are a good mother or not, and so on. So amygdala is essentially what makes the human mind the uh, elephant part of it, the emotional part of it. So, if you take that now and add other complications of intelligence among other things, ants are the most organized. They are almost like humans. They literally build underground cities, very complicated structures, and they fight wars. They are very cooperative. They even enslave. The losers of the war are enslaved by the winners. And they even use chemical weapons. And they use leaves to collect water and grow fungi for food. So they do some kind of agriculture. And they domesticate aphids for honey. So ants do pretty much everything humans do. But what is what is one thing you can think of that they don't do that humans do? Squash ants. They can't squash other ants, right? But they also don't have summer school, probably. <laughs> so we can do symbolic language. I can stand here and describe something to you, imaginary, that you have never seen, but you can sit there and imagine it. So we're able to communicate. We have this shared intelligence. Somebody builds a computer. I don't know how to build a computer, but I know how to use it to make a living out of it. So we have this capability to have uh, this incredible so-called non-zero arrangement where you can make a deal where we both benefit. And you can have infinite combinations of these. So this is kind of a, not just vertical genetic evolution, but it's also a cultural evolution. So we have a lot of these cultural values that we pass on. And it's not just from parents. You can have oblique from teachers, or you can have horizontal from friends, or by looking at what Steve Jobs did and trying to emulate his success. So we, we learn in so many ways. So our brain is clearly off the chart in terms of the scaling of body weight versus brain weight. There are animals with big brain, but not, they're not necessarily as intelligent as we are. You can see how far off we are uh, from the line. So there is something unique uh, among human beings in terms of our ability to share intelligence. This is what makes us the most cooperative species. And this is related to a lot of the dietary changes that happened along the way in the last million years. We went to a more uh, protein, high protein diet and so on. As I said, it shortened our gut. And it has changed the, the secretion in our brain. If you imagine all the stress, fight and flight kind of uh, hormones, you have neurotransmitters and uh, neuromodulators and neurohormones and so on. So you have things like dopamine and uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and testosterone and serotonin and so on and so on. And they all make you do certain things. And you can evoke those responses depending on how you communicate. Come on in. <laughs> right? I think you like it. <laughs> so, oxytocin is one of those things that is called a cuddle hormone or a love hormone, which makes you feel secure and feel good. In fact, when they use the oxytocin uh, spray on kids in a dorm, the kids started to give away money to their friends. But it has a side effect. It also makes you fearless and be protective of people who are close to you. So you are nicer to the people who are us, and they are more protective against them. And Paul Early would argue that this us versus them extends to about 150 people. So if you give anybody a phone book, or now you would do Google or whatever, everybody has a group of about 150 very close friends and relatives. Beyond that, 
it becomes harder to communicate or to be close. And this should be taken into account in a, a model like the agent-based model, because what you do depends on how it affects the people you consider us. Right? But there are two angles to it. You could be sitting in front of a TV and you see that there's a very bad flood or earthquake or a cholera outbreak in Haiti or something. And we are able to take out a wallet and send money because we feel some empathy. So you can have these uh, neurotransmitters or hormones being released, proteins being synthesized based on emotional response to visual cues or physical experiences, again going back to the amygdala or the elephant. Okay? So the brain is, is in that sense very complicated. So if you want to do the cognitive modeling, then the, the cerebellum and the brainstem take care of the basically autonomic functions like breathing and heart rate and balancing and locomotion and so on. But it's the elephant part, the neocortex, which makes us so uh, high thinkers, is also responsible for a lot of the negative things we do. But as I said, we have intrinsic values that can be reached with proper communication. And it's also related to things like this that are still not very well understood, but still work through the amygdala, where if you are an adult and speaking full-time multi-languages, at least two languages, then you're using the executive part of the, uh, the brain that makes you less susceptible to things like Alzheimer's, so the protein synthesis goes on for much longer, and it makes you much better at multitasking. So just teach your kids at least two languages. Right? So human brain is very complicated, but it can be understood, it can be modulated by things like meditation. Obviously there is better living through chemicals always, but they tend to have side effects and so on. So what else do we need? Do we need altruism? Is altruism evolutionarily stable or is it evolutionarily unstable? You see a lot of altruistic behavior in the natural world, right? They make friends, they develop cooperation, the prairie dogs uh, give out for each other, they protect food, and of course are very uh, cooperative and so on. <clears throat> And the evolutionary biologists always debate this because Richard Dawkins would say that's just part of the genetic uh, replication. So you are just trying to propagate your own genes. That's it. So it's put in the context of inclusive fitness or kid selection, or group selection, multi-level selection, and so on. But among humans, it turns out that actually uh, altruism can be taught either from the parents or from societal interactions. Uh, in the early childhood, you have a lot of Aesop's fables and so on about being charitable, being good, why it's important to be good, and so on. Uh, religion does that to some extent, so it's a question whether it does more damage than good, but nonetheless, since it's a learned behavior, it also can be lost, right? But if you look at other uh, important things like the tragedy of the commons, how many of you heard of the tragedy of the commons? Who has never heard of the tragedy of the commons? Tragedy of the Commons is essentially where you have a pasture that's shared by, uh, uh, let's say, multiple farmers, and they can buy as many cattle as they want to graze uh, the common pasture. But if nobody cares and they keep on buying uh, more and more cows, essentially then the pasture is not enough for everybody. So individual interest in this case can hurt the group interest, right? Are we doomed to the tragedy of the commons? Because atmosphere is a global common. If you pollute here, everybody is going to be affected. So are we just doomed for it? Is it evolutionarily ingrained in us? It turns out that even the parasites actually don't do the tragedy of the commons in terms of being most virulent. So if you have multiple parasites affecting, attacking a host, then if they only worry about themselves, then it's an energy loss in the host. Whereas it turns out that actually they are not trying to maximize virulence or just trying to take care of themselves. They do avoid the tragedy of the commons. And it turns out that uh, Eleanor Orson's work has shown in Africa and so on, with simple norms and punishments, you can make the human beings easily avoid the tragedy so human beings have in them to basically look at norms and internalize them and make it almost a preference. So if you have a rule that 
you have to stop at red light, even if you're driving at mid.